slides that I give are on our website, posted there now. But tonight, and I wanted to do this just to get it over with, because it's a, it's a, it's one of those diff- very difficult topics. Uh, it's one of the great mysteries of the Bible. It's the whole subject of election versus free will. And here we're trying to figure out, do we choose God or does God choose us? And my answer is yes, as I'll show you. So I'm going to try to talk uh, till about 8, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers um, about 8 o'clock. So here we are, in, having dealt with the definition of soteriology, now we're getting into this whole subject of election. And I'm not sure if I'll be able to finish all this tonight, but we'll give it a good attempt. We're going to look at the definition and uses of the term election. We're going to try to understand election in the totality of God's character. I'll show you the biblical case for divine sovereignty. God chooses us. And then I'll show you the case for human responsibility. We choose God. And I'll try to convince you that the Bible teaches both of these. And then, as time permits, I'm going to try to steer us, warn us about extremes people fall into on either side of this debate. And so we'll try to stay away from those extremes as I as I warn you about it. But it's a very delicate, difficult subject for us, for the finite human mind to wrap itself around. But first of all, um, definition and uses. Uh, I got this definition from Charles Ryrie. Election is the action of God in choosing those who will be saved as members of the body of Christ. And I'll show you the passages in a little bit, but at some point in eternity past, God made a move towards you and towards me and decided to bless us with His grace. Now, before we get into that particular issue of election, um, one of the things to understand is that the concept of election, God choosing us, is all over the Bible. It's uh, a doctrine that's impossible to escape. And you can take it from me. For many years I tried to escape it because it didn't seem very American to me that God chooses some and not others. So, for example, just to give you a few um, usages of this, I hope you brought your Bible with you. Deuteronomy 4, verse 37, this is how God dealt with the nation of Israel at the beginning of His program with Israel. Deuteronomy 4, 37 it says of Israel, because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants and after them. Descendants after them. So why didn't God use the Egyptians as his chosen nation? Why didn't he use the Phoenicians? Why didn't he use the Assyrians? Well, you have to ask God about that. Because God made a choice to choose Israel as his instrument of blessing to the world. Well, I know why God chose Israel, because they're, they're better at money. The Jews are. Um, they're smarter. They've got more of their kids in medical school and law school. No. If you look at Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, it says, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the other peoples, for in fact you were the fewest. So God did not choose the nation of Israel because of some quality in in them. And this is basically what you call unconditional election. Election towards them without any condition in them as to why he chose them. It's just something God in his sovereignty decided to do. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 1 through 4, you learn about a guy named Cyrus. Cyrus was God's instrument to 
release the children of Israel out of the Egyptian bondage, uh, excuse me, not the Egyptian bondage, the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And in Isaiah 45, verse 1, it says, Thus um, says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, And then down in verse 4, it says, For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have called your name. Now this is 200 years before the man was born. God called out through the writings of Isaiah, the prophecies of Isaiah, Cyrus. And he said, He is going to be my chosen instrument through which the nation of Israel is going to be released from the 70-year captivity. And what's so interesting about this is, to the best of our knowledge, Cyrus was not even a believer. Because Isaiah 45 and verse 4, Cyrus a Persian, it says this, For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen one, I have called you by your name. I have given you your title, though you have not known me. So this, this man Cyrus had no personal relationship with the Lord at all, and yet 200 years before the man was born, God called his name and chose him as the instrument through which the nation would be released from the 70-year captivity. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Um, there, Jesus, as the branch, is called the chosen one. So God the Father chose God the Son to fulfill His great role through His death on the cross and His resurrection from the dead. I have to go through these verses fast. I'm sorry for that. Matthew 24, 22. It talks about the elect. For the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Well, who are the elect? Well, in context, it's the chosen ones in the tribulation period. So there are believers in the tribulation period, probably I would guess believing Jews, and they are called the elect or the chosen of God. And then if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, what you'll discover is you are also the chosen of God. That's the terminology that the Bible uses. Colossians 3.2 uh, would be an example of that. And then also in the book of Titus, uh, chapter 1 and verse 1. It's sort of interesting to me that when the biblical New Testament writers talk about this subject of election, they typically mention it right at the beginning of the book, sometimes in the first verse. And I find that interesting because we as evangelicals are kind of embarrassed by this doctrine. But God's not. Titus 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the foreknowledge of the truth which is in accordance with godliness. So you see all these different usages of election and God choosing uh, all over the scripture. Now one of the things that I got very troubled about as a very new Christian is I sat and studied this doctrine in isolation of everything else the Bible teaches about God. So I sat and meditated and meditated and meditated on this doctrine without studying the totality of God's Word, and I started to get a bitter spirit because I started to think, well, God is not fair. And I would caution you against that. When the doctrine of election or God's choosing is revealed in the Bible, it's never revealed in isolation of his other attributes. It's always brought forth in the totality of who God is. For example, take a look at Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. Now, if your English teacher ever gets mad at you for run-on sentences, just quote the Apostle Paul. Because Ephesians 4, really through 14, is one giant sentence in Greek. It's what you call a massive run-on sentence. 
And what, the reason that's significant is because as you look at verse 4, it says He chose us in Him. So there's His calling or choosing of us. And then because this sentence is one giant sentence, it's all linked to God's other attributes. If you go down to the end of verse 4, you'll see love. If you go towards the beginning of verse 6, you'll see glory. As you move into verse 11, you'll see according to His eternal purpose or His purpose. So the way the Bible reveals this subject of election is it wants us to understand that God, when He exercises this prerogative of choice, does so in harmony with all of His other attributes. And that's what I was missing as a new Christian where I was just focused on this one doctrine and becoming bitter against God because I didn't understand it all. But now, kind of in hindsight, what I've learned to do when I don't understand something in the Bible or where something doesn't seem fair to me, and there are things in the Bible that I don't understand and still don't seem fair to me, at the end of the day, I just rest in who He is. And it's to the point now where I don't have to understand everything. And kind of as you grow in Christ, you know, as a new Christian, I used to want all the loose ends uh, battened down. But now growing in a knowledge of God's attributes, I don't know if it's necessary that I understand everything. Because I know at the end of the day, whether I understand God doing something or not, God is a God of love and grace and mercy. And He doesn't exercise this attribute or this prerogative of choosing independent of who he is. I know this also at the end of the day that the Bible two times, 1 Timothy 2 4 and 2 Peter 3 9, both times it says, Who does God want saved? The world, everybody. He desires that all should be saved and come to a knowledge of Him. And one of the verses, you know, that I go back to quite a bit in my personal walk with the Lord is the book of Isaiah chapter 55 and verses 8 and 9. Uh, Whenever you find yourself frustrated with God, you have to remember that your mind is just a little pea in comparison to an ocean. And God knows things we don't know. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways... Your ways, declare the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So that's just an exhortation as we look at this controversial and difficult doctrine tonight to try to look at it in harmony with everything the Scripture reveals about God. That kind of makes the hard medicine go down a little bit easier, I've discovered in personal experience. So the concept of election is used many, many places in the Bible as we have seen in many different ways. And the scripture asks us or invites us to examine this doctrine in harmony with God's total attributes. So having said all that, let me lay out the case for divine sovereignty. And if you happen to believe in free will at the exclusion of divine sovereignty, don't get mad at me quite yet, because in a little bit I'll be laying out the case for free will. And what I want to communicate to you is the Bible really teaches both of these ideas. So let's take a look at um, divine sovereignty. Take a look at John 6 and verse 44. What do we mean by divine sovereignty? What we mean is God chooses us. And I'll show you scriptures for these points. What what I'm talking about is a pre-temporal choice. Pre-temporal means ahead of time. In other words, before time existed, God made a decision to unilaterally make a move of grace towards you. It's a pre-temporal choice of God as to who would be saved, and the passing by of others. This is, as I tried to show you with God's working with Israel, the way it's presented in the Bible, I believe, is it's unconditional. 
Meaning God in eternity past didn't look at me and said, well, you know, uh, Andy, um, I know you're going to grow up and you're going to become the pastor at Sugarland Bible Church. So I'll choose you because there's some kind of quality in you that's admirable. No, that would make God's choice of me conditional, right? Conditioned in something in me. And what I think the Scripture teaches is an unconditional choice that He has made towards us. Now, let me give you some verses that I think support this. There are several in the Gospel of John. Uh, John 6, verse 44. I'm going to give you some of the strongest divine sovereignty verses that I, that I know of in the Scripture. John chapter 6 and verse 44, Jesus is speaking, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, this word draw is uh, el kuo, and it's the same verb that's used in John 21, verse 6, I believe it is, and verse 11, regarding the miraculous catch of fish. Remember what was happening? They were dragging, that's the word draw there, they were dragging the fish uh, into the boat with resistance. So, if the word is used the same way here in John 6.44, what God has done is He has drawn you to Himself. In fact, if God did not exercise grace towards you and draw you to yourself, you really couldn't come. Because Romans 3.11 says no, no one seeks God. Luke 19.10 says the Son of, Son of Man comes to seek and save that which is lost. So I, I used to think, you know, as a new Christian, I woke up one day and said, you know, today's the day I'm going to get saved. And uh, in hindsight, I realized what had happened. God set the whole thing up. He put the right conversations together, the right people in my path, the right life experiences where I was spiritually seeking God, searching for God, and He was drawing me. And what was I doing? Well, I was like that catch of fish in a net, I was resisting. So people say, well, what role did we play in salvation? Well, here's our role. We resisted God. You know, we fought Him. And yet He in His compassion drew us to Himself. You'll see the same thing down in John 6, 65. John chapter 6, verse 65 for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted from the Father. John uh, 6, verses 69 and 70. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. So the apostles said, we made a choice towards you, God. And Jesus comes back and says, I made a choice towards you before you made a choice towards me. In, take a look at John 15, verse 16 for a minute. At the very beginning of Christ's ministry, Jesus called the disciples. And as you're going there, I'm going to read to you Matthew 4.20. Uh, Follow me, he said to them, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20 of Matthew 4 says, Immediately they left their nets and followed him. See how it's putting the action on their part? So, his ministry lasted, Christ's ministry lasted about three years. And at the beginning of the ministry, they probably thought they chose Christ, which they did. They did choose him. They left their nets, and followed Him. Then at the very end of Christ's ministry in the upper room, three years have passed, and Jesus pulls this whammy on him. John 15, verse 16, You did not choose Me, but I chose you, and appointed you, and so forth. So these disciples thought that they cho chose the Lord. I'm not denying that they did. But in reality, what you discover is God did something 
for them to them. And he made some kind of action towards them ahead of time. Matthew 16, let's look at this real quick. One day Peter had a thought. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Peter raised his hand. Well, the Bible doesn't say he raised his hand, but he gave the right answer. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, Peter probably thought that he had those thoughts all on his own initiative. He was the smartest guy in the room, right? And then Jesus in verse 17 said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So Peter, you just had the wonderful thought that you had because my Father made some sort of move towards you and allowed you to have that particular thought. See, these are all verses, you start putting these together and you see God is, is doing things in our past. Sometimes without even us being aware of them. Let's look at the book of Acts for a minute. Acts 13 and verse 48. This is a very strong sovereignty passage. This is Paul's first missionary journey where tons and tons of Gentiles are getting saved. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. Watch this. And as many as had been appointed, appointed to eternal life believed. So it says a bunch of Gentiles believed. Praise God. But part of the verse says they believed because they had been divinely appointed to believe. Very, very strong sovereignty passage there. Uh, take a look at Acts 16.14. This is Lydia, Paul's first convert uh, in Philippi. Normally Paul would go to the synagogue first, but in Philippi there wasn't a synagogue. So we went to a river. I've actually stood by the river when I was in Israel a couple summers ago. And he finds this woman named Lydia. And this is Paul's first European convert, and it's a description in Acts 16, verse 14, how this woman got saved. It says, A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And look at this. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And that's how a conversion takes place. Paul gives the message. The Lord opens somebody's heart. And the person whose heart is now open believes. You've got to have all three of those things happening together. A faithful proclamation of the message. The Lord opening somebody's heart. And then the person that's hearing the message responding by way of faith. But you'll notice that had the Lord not opened her heart, you get the idea that Lydia probably could not, would not have ever believed. Um, of course, the book of Romans is filled with this idea. Romans 8, verses 29 and 30. Some verses we looked at last time. For those whom he foreknow, foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of the Son of God, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he also justified, he also glorified. Now, you'll notice that we believe and are justified and on our way to future glory. But even before we believe so that we can be justified and one day glorified, God has already done three things in the past towards us. They are a foreknowledge of us. They are a predestination of us. They are a calling of us. And we finally get into the act through human volition on step number four, 
where three prior steps have already been executed by God in eternity past. See, that's a very strong sovereignty passage. Grand central station of divine sovereignty is Romans 9. So let's look at that just for a minute. Romans 9 and verse 11. It's talking about Jacob and Esau in the womb of their mother. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to His choice would stand, not because of works, but because of Him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Now, in the ancient Near East, it never works that way. The older never serves the younger. The rights of the firstborn always go to the older. And God says, I'm about to switch things around here. I'm about to give my favor not to the firstborn, but to Jacob rather than Esau. And as you go through the book of Genesis, I think there are 11 times where this happens. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to do something transcultural here. I'm going to do something countercultural. And it's not because one kid will end up being good and one kid will end up being bad or anything like that. It says very clearly, before either child in the womb of their mother had done anything, God made this choice towards Jacob and he passed over Esau. And then verse 13 is very troubling, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, you read that word hate, it's not talking about emotional hatred. When the word hate many times is used in the Bible, it's talking about a non-choice. So, for example, in Luke 14, verse 26, it, Jesus says the requirement of discipleship is to hate your mother and father. Well, obviously, we're not called as Christ's disciples to hate your parents because the fifth commandment is what? Honor your mother and father. What he's saying is if you have to make a choice between mom and dad's will and God's will, to be his disciple, you choose God over parents. That's what the whole concept of hatred means here. God could not hate Esau because God so loved the world. At the same time, this word hate is used. We transport our 21st century understanding of the word back into the text, but biblically it's talking about a non-choice. He chose one, uh, but not the other. And as you go down to Romans 9, verse 20, it says, So then he has mercy on whom he desires and hardens whom he desires. And it's talking there about Pharaoh how God actually hardened Pharaoh's heart. God used Pharaoh as an instrument of oppression of the Jewish people so that God could judge Pharaoh. Now, when you look at that whole story, you have to understand that Pharaoh, in the book of Exodus, hardened his own heart towards God, I think, about six times. The Exodus narrative says Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And finally, it's kind of scary the way the Bible reads. It says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. In other words, God finally, in his sovereignty, gave Pharaoh over to what Pharaoh already wanted to do. But even though that's true, that's still a divine, a very strong divine sovereignty passage. Now, Paul in Romans 9, anticipates an objection. This isn't fair. This isn't American. Verse 20 says this, On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? You have to understand that us raising moral objections about how God runs His universe is like a piece of, it's like a cup on a potter's wheel and the cup gets mad at the potter because the cup says to the the potter, you know, I don't want to be a cup, I want to be a vase. Well, that's none of your business whether you're a cup or you're a vase. You are a piece of clay, I'm the potter. 
So that's sort of what we are like when we voice our objections against God and say, God, you're not fair. God, you're not doing things correctly. God, you're not right. It's like a, you know, a little tiny person with limited intelligence and a corrupted human nature speaking against a perfectly righteous God who is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. So we have to really look at our motives when we get into this position of challenging God. Revelation 13.8, and it says the same thing in Revelation 17.8, makes a very uh, interesting statement. Revelation 13.8 talks about beast worshipers in the tribulation period. It says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone's name, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the Lamb who was slain. So people in the tribulation period are making a decision to reject Jesus and worship the Antichrist. And then what we discover in Revelation 13.8 and Revelation 17.8 is the reason they're making that decision is because their names were never written in the Lamb's Book of Life to begin with. Now, this concept of election is true of specific individuals. For example, notice the book of Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It's a description of why Jeremiah ended up becoming a prophet. Why did Jeremiah end up becoming a prophet? Jeremiah 1, verses 4 and 5 explains it. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born... In other words, before Jeremiah did anything good or bad, I consecrated you, I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So, why did Jeremiah become a prophet? I mean, did he have the right skills and the temperament to become a prophet? Did he visit a career guidance counselor? And the career guidance counselor said, you know, you'd be a heck of a prophet. No, Jeremiah became a prophet because God made a move towards him in that direction before he was even born. And this is also true with the Apostle Paul. Why did the Apostle Paul become an apostle? Notice uh, Galatians 1, verses 15 and 16. It says the same thing in the New Testament. Galatians 1, uh, verses 15 and 16. But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not consult with flesh and blood. Why did Paul end up becoming a prophet? Because he was chosen for that position from his mother's womb. See, these are all sovereignty passages. Acts 9, verses 15 and 16 talks about how Paul would bear Christ's name before the Gentiles. So Peter is the apostle to the Jews. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Well, maybe those two got upset one day. Hey, I want to, maybe Peter says, I want to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul says, I want to be the apostle to the Jews. Well, that's not a decision for you to make. That decision has already been made by God in eternity past. Uh, Other examples of this is Romans 16.13, where Rufus is called a choice or chosen man in the Lord. And then in 2 John, you have a, a church meeting in a woman's house. Why is it meeting in her house? Because 2 John 1 and 2 John 13 says she is a chosen lady. She's called the elect lady. So sometimes this choosing of God involves individuals. Sometimes it involves entire groups of people.
as is the case in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and so forth. There it's talking about a group of people there, what we call North Central Turkey. Mentions the places of geography, Pontus, Bithynia, Asia, Cappadocia, Galatia, and that whole region of people. Believers in that entire region are believers because they are chosen in God. And sometimes this choosing of God also involves a decision as to who will be passed over. For example, you take Judas, John 13 and verse 18. Why is it that Judas ended up being the betrayer of Christ? Why not Matthew? Why not some other why not John? Why not some other apostle? Jesus says this of Judas, I did not speak Of all of you, I know the ones I have chosen, but is that the Scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now, you'll notice that that's a quotation from the Psalms. The Psalms were written a thousand years in advance. A thousand years in advance, Judas' life read like a script. Because that's the way God set it up. Uh, Romans 9 and verse 22 is another example of God passing by some. Romans 9 verse 22 says, What if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much patience the vessels of wrath, watch this, prepared for destruction. Speaking there of Pharaoh and how God actually prepared Pharaoh as an instrument of destruction. Uh, Another very strong passage on sovereignty is 1 Peter 2 and verse 8. Every time I read this, I shudder. 1 Peter 2 and verse 8, speaking of the Jews stumbling over Christ, it says, For they stumble because they are disobedient to the Word, and to this doom they were also appointed. So they tripped over Christ, stumbled over Him, and yet 1 Peter 2 eight says they were appointed to trip or to stumble. Sometimes the choosing of God includes our good works. Jeremiah was chosen as a prophet. Paul was chosen as an apostle, Galatians 1, Acts 9. And the works that you and I walk in as God's people are also part of God's predestined plan. Notice uh, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. We all know Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace we are saved through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But then look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Why did I become the pastor of Sugarland Bible Church? It's a good work that God prepared beforehand. Why are you sitting in this class? It's a good work that God prepared beforehand. See, you, 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 it's, as, as uncomfortable as this doctrine is, it's biblically, to my mind, impossible to escape it. Yet, as much as everything I, I have said is accurate and true, there's something else that's true. The Bible teaches equally the reality of human responsibility. It teaches the idea of free will. And just as, as, as many passages I produced on divine sovereignty, I could equally produce just as much many passages on free will. For example, 
Genesis 15 and verse 6. This is speaking of Abram. Then he, that's Abram, believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Why did Abram believe? Because he believed. That passage, other verses may say it, but that passage says absolutely nothing about God making some sort of move towards Abram. It's narrating the passage from the human point of view. We all know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever, whosoever, that's, that's a pretty big group, isn't it? Whosoever. That whosoever what? Believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Nothing in there about you receive life because God chose you. Other passages may say that, but this one says we receive life because we make a decision through human volition and human will to believe in the Lord. Acts 16, verses 30 and 31. This is the Philippian jailer asking life's most important question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. They put, that would be Paul and Silas, put the onus back on the Philippian jailer and said, you exercise your volition and will and believe. Acts 17 and verse 30. This is uh, Paul on Mars Hill. Had the chance in Greece to stand on Mars Hill where Paul most likely gave this address. He gets to the very end of it. Speaking now to unbelieving Gentiles. And he says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. In the course, we're going to be spending a lot of time on the word repent, so don't worry about it now. The short answer is it means change of mind. What he's saying is you change your mind about Jesus. Nothing here about God overriding their free will or their minds. He puts the onus on them to exercise their volition and to change their minds uh, about Jesus Christ. And, uh, of course, at the very end of the Bible, Revelation 22, in verse 17, makes a tremendous statement about human free will. And it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. So, who can come and have their thirst quenched through what Jesus provides? Whoever wants it. So there, that verse clearly is placing the ledger on free will. Something else that I think helps us with this whole issue of free will is understanding that we as human beings are image bearers of God. That is what God said about Adam and Eve, our forebears, going all the way back to Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. It says very clearly that God created them, male and female, in his own image. Well, what does that mean to be made in God's image? What it means is we share in God's communicable attributes. There are certain attributes that God has that we share in. We don't share in all His attributes or else He wouldn't be God, right? He's got to have some attributes exclusive to Him like omniscience, all-knowing, omnipotence, all-power, omnipresence everywhere at the same time. But At the same time, there are many attributes that I share with God. And one of the things I share with God is a free will. That's what being an image bearer is. And that explains why God, in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, put a tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. You ever ask that question? Just get that tree out of there. And if that tree's gone then they can't rebel and all of the trouble we've been in ever since can't happen, right? The answer to that is there has to be a tree of knowledge in Eden. 
If there is no tree of knowledge in Eden, then people really don't have a choice. A choice means you have to have an avenue for rebellion should you choose to go that direction. And if that choice was not there, God would not be respecting how he made Adam and Eve in his own image. Now people say, well, that's just pre-fall. Post-fall, it's different. We have no choice in the post-fall world. May I just remind you that the fall never erased our image-bearing status. The theologians like to use this expression, our image-bearing status has been effaced by the fall, but not erased. Genesis 9-6, that's post-flood, that's long after the fall, calls man and women his image-bearers. James 3.9, New Testament, calls us also made in God's likeness. So even in our fallen state, we still retain this dignity as image bearers, and therefore God, when he orchestrates salvation, has to factor in the free will of individuals. If that free will is not factored in, then God would not be respecting how he has made us in his image. So my point that I'm really trying to get at is the Bible, as best I can tell, teaches both doctrines. Teaches divine sovereignty, and at the same time, it teaches human free will. Election, or God's choosing of us, does not obliterate human free will or human responsibility. Somehow in God, these two ideas exist. And the foolishness that we put ourselves in is we try to understand this. This is coming from a source of knowledge that's outside of time. He's infinite. To God, who is timeless, these types of contradictions don't exist. As we wrestle with, with these things from a time-bound perspective, we see an obvious contradiction. But that's because we're looking at it from the human point of view, not necessarily from the divine point of view. So back to that Judas passage, John 13, verse 18, did Judas exercise his free will to betray Christ? Yes, he did. But at the same time, the moment he exercised his free will to betray Christ, what he did was predicted in the Psalms, written a thousand years in advance. So somehow God used the free will of Judas to execute a plan written a thousand years in advance. And only God, who can pull something like that off. Acts 2.23 is one of my favorite verses. Because in the same verse, you'll see both statements foreknowledge, and human choice. So who killed Christ? Peter on the day of Pentecost says this man, Jesus, was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You, speaking to the Jews, nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Who killed Christ? Well, the first part of the verse says God the Father killed Christ because it was part of a predetermined plan. You keep reading through the same verse and then Peter says you, uh, unbelieving Jews, killed Christ, putting the onus on human responsibility. So both doctrines are there within the span of a, of a single verse. So the danger is using election to somehow obliterate free will or using free will to somehow obliterate election. And that's why there's this great struggle in the body of Christ. One camp says one thing, another camp says a different thing, and they're all gravitating towards their favorite verses and throwing them against their adversaries like a, snow, like a snowball fight. When in reality, both doctrines are accurate. It just depends on what part of the Bible you happen to be reading at any given time. Charles Ryrie in his survey of Bible doctrine says this, there are unsaved elect people alive today 
though the elect are now lost and will not be saved until they believe. So what he's saying there is election does not, in the mind of God, override the human responsibility to believe. Both concepts are there. Um, a wonderful title to a book on this whole thing is by Norman Geisler, and I love the title, Chosen But Free, because it's expressing both ideas. We are chosen in God, but at the same time, to arrive us get us to arrive at that place, God did not override our free will. And something else that's very helpful to me as I think about this is an illustration Harry Ironside gave to a prior generation. He says, you're walking into heaven and there's a door. And on the outside, the door reads this, all who will enter here. And you walk through the door and then you look back on the other side of the wall and there's another sign that says, welcome you who are chosen from the foundation of the world. Something else that's helped me with this is the husband and wife analogy. Are, are we not called the bride of Christ? We're the bride, he is the groom. Now, when you got married, did you choose your spouse or did your spouse choose you? I hope the answer is both, or you might need marital counseling. I mean, I did what I could to get Anne's attention. I put on the full court press, but the, and she's up there laughing. But the fact of the matter is, I can woo her all I wanted, but she had to make some kind of decision towards me, see? And this is how it is in our relationship with God. He woos us, and he works but he is not going to override your decision to believe in him any more than you would want to marry someone who has made no decision towards you. And people, you know, when you talk too much about free will, people get a little nervous and they say, well, you know, aren't you um, overriding God's sovereignty? And I find there's a particular segment in the body of Christ that's so eager to protect God's sovereignty that they don't want to allow any free will whatsoever. The fact of the matter is God can use the free moral choices of His creatures to accomplish His sovereign will. That's what He did with Judas. Now, that does not shrink God, to my mind. That enlarges God. That makes me want to, throughout the ages, glorify God all the more that he can use rebellious or good choices on the part of people that are free, decision-wise, to execute his plan. One last thing to talk about here is the extremes to avoid. Here's some extremes to avoid in this whole discussion. Number one, using one set of texts to rewrite another set of texts. People on the sovereignty side of the equation get so into the sovereignty of God that they use a lot of the verses that we went over to override free will and they'll develop a doctrine that goes something like this. You can't believe on your own. God has to believe for you. And the doctrine of this is regeneration precedes faith. Faith is a gift. And when you question them why they hold to this particular doctrine when I really can't find it taught anywhere in the Bible, it's all a desire to protect the sovereignty of God. John 16 and verse 9 describes what the Holy Spirit does prior to our salvation. He comes to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment Verse 9 says, sin because they do not believe in me. What does the Holy Spirit do with the unbeliever? He does not override their free will. He does not believe for them. He does not regenerate them so that they can believe. Regeneration is the result of faith, not the cause of it, as I'll be showing you later on in the course. What the Holy Spirit does is he convicts us of our need to believe. 
And if God were to suddenly override our free will, other than just conviction and annoying us and bothering us, he wouldn't be respecting us as image bearers of God. And so what people all of the time say is faith is a gift. In fact, this was in our Sugarland Bible Church doctrinal statement. The founders of the church didn't put this in, but some folks got onto the elder board over the course of time that had a very strong sovereignty persuasion. And there was a statement in there for a while that faith is actually a gift of God. And fortunately, our elders, to their credit, when I presented them with the biblical evidence, took that statement out and returned it back to the way it originally read. But people say faith is a gift, and they like to quote Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. And they say, there it is, faith is a gift. The problem is faith is a feminine noun. Gift is a neuter noun. In Greek, the genders, if one is modifying the other, have to line up. Faith is not the gift. The gift is the result of the faith, which is salvation. That's the gift. But God does not give you the gift of faith. He does not regenerate you so that you can believe. So that would be an example of using one group of texts to rewrite another. Now, people on the free will side of the equation do the same thing. And I've heard this argument for years, and basically what people say is, well, God has seen the movie. He knows how it's all going to turn out. And he picks winners. So God knew that I would trust Christ, so therefore God picked me because he knew in the, in the past corridors of time that I would be a winner and I would pick Christ. Well, you see, that makes God's choosing of me not unconditional, but what? conditioned on something that's the name for this is the prescience view pre knowledge view science meaning knowledge and so what people like to say is for those whom he foreknew he predestined and called and justified and glorified and they love to camp on foreknew the word there is prognosco and what they think that means is god through omniscience, knew that I would pick Christ, so God picked me. Because God's seen the movie. That's their understanding of foreknowledge. The problem with that is the same word prognosco that's used in Romans 8.29 is also used in Romans 11.2. Romans 11.2 is a description of God's program with the nation of Israel. And everybody you know, agrees that God chose Israel not because he saw in the end that they would choose him, but he chose them unilaterally, unconditionally. So I think the prescience view is reading something into foreknow that that is foreign to the teachings of the Apostle Paul. So avoid the extremes. And then one more extreme to avoid is don't use election to remove human responsibility. William Carey, famous missionary, wanted to go and evangelize the heathen. And he came from a strong, reformed background. And when he expressed this desire to his theology teacher, his professor said, young man, sit down. If God wants to reach the heathen, he will do it without your help or mine. So what happened in that case is foreknowledge was camped on to such a degree that it was used to rewrite or to remove our human responsibility to evangelize the lost. We, as God's people, are responsible to preach the gospel to who? Every creature. We do not preach the gospel just to the elect for the simple reason that people don't have an E for elect stamped on their forehead. I don't know who they are. My job is to just get the gospel 
and your job is to get the gospel to everyone. So with the subject of election, we have to understand there's things God does and there's things we do. This business of foreknowledge and choosing and all of these things that God does, the Bible reveals these things, but it never tells us to worry about these things. Just know that God is working. You, on the other hand, get down to business and fulfill your own responsibility. And the danger is using election to remove the responsibilities that we all have. For example, how many Puritans do you know? Yeah, so-and-so and so-and-so moved down, down the street. Very nice Puritan couple. Well, who are the Puritans? The Puritans were those that came from Europe. They built in America a city on a shining hill. They founded the Ivy League. They are the ones that built a Christian civilization on these shores, on the East Coast, beginning on the East Coast. And within a couple of generations, they lost the whole thing. Have you been to the Ivy League lately? About as pagan as you can get. What happened to these people? How, how can you build a shining city on a hill and then lose control of the whole thing? The answer is, when you get into Puritan writings, they camped so heavily on election and foreknowledge that slowly what started to happen is they were using that as an excuse not to evangelize. In fact, the Puritans, in some cases, would not even evangelize their own children. And so they went defunct. They disappeared. That's an example of what can happen in this area uh, of extremes. So God has his part. We have our part. And any time someone is using a section of the Bible in a way that's getting you to escape responsibility, you know you've gone to an extreme you know that the doctrine is being abused. And in another doctrine, the return of Christ, that's what was happening in 2 Thessalonians 3 uh, with the Thessalonians and the return of Christ. And Paul had taught them the imminent return of Christ, that Christ can come back at any minute. So they said, well, Christ can come back at any minute. What's the point in paying my mortgage? What's the point in putting my kids through college? What's the point of holding down a job? And you go through 2 Thessalonians 3 and you find Paul telling the Thessalonians you need to start exercising church discipline on these people because they are abusing a doctrine to get out of basic life's responsibilities. That is the great fear that we are extreme we can be pushed into so we can actually use this doctrine to escape the realities that god wants us to fulfill so all things being said let god do his thing don't try to rewrite the doctrine or pretend it's not there recognize there's a tension in the bible election and free will are difficult concepts to grasp and comprehend and while we may be wrestling with these things and may not understand them all, I do understand this much. I know what I'm supposed to do, which is to preach the gospel to all creatures. There's no ambiguity there, right? No debate there. So tried to give you some balance on this subject. A lot of the presentations you get, because the speaker's trying to prove something one side or the other, you get uh, kind of presentations that are lopsided. I've done my very best to present balance. So we've looked at the definition and uses of election, looking at election in the totality of God's character. We've looked at the case for divine sovereignty. We've looked at the case for human responsibility. We've looked at this fact that the Bible really teaches both of these ideas. And then we've looked at some extremes to stay away from, such as using one set of text to rewrite another or using election as a way to escape uh, responsibility. So next time we'll take a look at the doctrine of the atonement. So at this time I'll stop talking, and those that need to pick up their kids are free to do so. And uh, you, we can ask some questions at this point. Any questions I can't answer, Richard will answer them for us. Yeah. Uh-huh.